Okay, um, thanks to everyone for staying till the end. And thanks very much to, for the um, invitation and introduction. Um, can people hear me okay in the back? Okay, great. Um, and yeah, sorry to brace for this. So, so this um, this will be about uh, algorithmic thresholds and mean field spin glasses. Um, this will be, uh, so there will be some collaborations with Ahmed and with Andrea that I'll mention, and uh, some with Bryce. Uh, Bryce is not shy, this is just some technical glitch, but I think it should be the only one. Uh, so, so let's get started. Uh, so the, the plan for this talk is to uh, start with some setup, there will be some motivation, there will be a precise uh, model, and there will be some discussion of what uh, is um, predicted for this model and for the problem I talk about and related issues in uh, statistical physics. Um, we'll be looking at an optimization problem eventually, and um, I'll try to show you a very nice uh, concrete uh, algorithm that uh, was developed in 2018. And in the third part of the talk, I'll say something about how this algorithm is kind of best possible in some sense, and it'll be in a bit of a different sense from the usual ways in which algorithms are best possible. Um, and then the last part of the talk, I'll kind of give a bit of an epilogue. I'll discuss some extensions of the qualitative picture that, that I'll try to build up in the, those three parts. Okay, um, so let's get started with the setup. Uh, so I want to discuss a couple of um, motivating uh, problems uh, and examples before uh, getting to the precise uh, model for this talk. Um, the first one is uh, clustering. So uh, as most of us know, um, what happens in clustering is we have some underlying uh, network structure and we'd like to detect some communities that are inherent to the network. And a common way to formalize this problem is through the stochastic block model um, in which you have n vertices, maybe people on a social network, and they're split into two equal groups. And we're gonna construct a random graph which has some edge probability p uh, within groups and some, let's say, smaller edge probability q between different groups. So, so the picture looks something like this. You can see there's a much higher edge density on the left side and on the right side. Um, but of course, the problem is hard because we, we don't get to see the colors, we just see this unlabeled network and we'd like to uncover the, um, the partition that, that we, we don't know. Um, so there are many good approaches for this problem. Um, for example, uh, belief propagation. Um, but a natural one to, to try thinking about if you've never seen the problem before is the maximum likelihood estimator. And if you think about what that means in this context, it basically amounts to solving the minimum bisection problem on this random graph. Okay, and this is a random quadratic optimization problem. Uh, even if you ignore the fact that it's on a discrete state space, it's not convex. Um, so it's uh, a bit unclear what to expect and how, how to analyze um, what's possible. Um, if you try to find the min bisection of a graph exactly, uh, it's going to be NP hard. Um, this might be overly pessimistic, there are certain uh, convex relaxations you can try to study as well, um, but uh, these, are, these are not optimal for this problem. Uh, so, so already just with this very stylized problem, uh, we, we have a natural approach and kind of the existing frameworks we have for understanding uh, computation uh, don't tell us the answer. There's a, there's a missing understanding here. Uh, there's a similar story for uh, tensor PCA. Um, which is actually a bit uh, more closely related to what I'll focus on today. So in this problem, uh, we want to recover some unknown signal vector on the sphere in n dimensions. That's what I mean with this uh, script S. Uh, what we observe is the piece tensor power of this vector times some signal strength lambda plus a Gaussian noise tensor. So if, if P is two, then uh, this is a random matrix plus a rank one signal, but in general you can do the same thing with tensors. Um, this is relevant for all kinds of um, applications. And again, the maximum likelihood estimator is solving a non-convex op polynomial optimization problem. And it's NP-hard in the worst case, but uh, it's random, so, so perhaps we can understand it a bit better. Okay, so, so this leads to the motivating question of this talk, which is, if I give you a random optimization problem, what are the kind of fundamental limits for, for what we can do algorithmically and statistically in these problems? Okay, um, 
With that being said, uh, I'll describe the precise model for this talk. Uh, it's called the mean field spin glass. And um, what this is is a random function, uh, which I'll call a Hamiltonian because uh, this comes from physics where this is a, an energy function for a system. Um, but it's going to be nothing more than a polynomial in n variables with random coefficients. So uh, one uh, example of a situation I'll be interested in is a random cubic polynomial. So my input sigma is an n-dimensional vector. Uh, what's a cubic polynomial of n variables? Well, it amounts to choosing about n cubed coefficients. And I'm just going to make every single coefficient an independent standard Gaussian. Um, there's this one over n factor that will just ensure that the, um, the maximum of my functions are always of order n, which is just a normalization. In general, for larger p, instead of taking a degree three polynomial, um, I could take a larger degree polynomial, which corresponds to a p tensor model. Um, and it's again just a generic degree p homogeneous polynomial um, with, with random Gaussian coefficients. Okay, um, how can you think about this? Uh, one nice uh, way to start thinking about it is that it's a Gaussian process and it has a nice explicit um, covariance function. Um, in particular, uh, this covariance function depends only on the um, inner product between the two inputs, sigma and sigma prime, so it's kind of rotationally invariant in distribution. And uh, I'm going to think of uh, this function as operating either on the sphere uh, or occasionally on the cube, which is called the easing situation. Um, and we're going to um, have a lot of kind of prior predictions about this model coming from physicists who will tell us all about the, um, the so-called Gibbs measure at inverse temperature beta, which is given by taking a uniform distribution. So here, d sigma is, say, the uniform distribution on the sphere. And I'm going to weight it by an exponential factor in this uh, energy function. OK. Um, so where does this problem come from? Well, it's actually very closely linked to tensor PCA. Um, it's basically what you get when you think about the null model in tensor PCA, and you think about the, the log of the likelihood. Um, and the analysis of this model uh, led to the statistically optimal uh, signal estimation for the tensor PCA problem. Um, so this is separately from computationally optimal, which is a, um, a separate story. Um, it's also directly connected to more combinatorial types of random optimization problems, such as random max cut, uh, random KSAT. Um, a nice example uh, is that if you look at a kirchhoff Renyi random graph with, uh, with just sparse but has kind of a, a growing uh, degree uh, slowly with n, uh, then the min bisection value is given by half the number of edges. That's n lambda over 4. And then the next order correction term uh, to, has this constant c star, which is explicit and comes from understanding a spin glass model very precisely. Um, this is a result of uh, Suba in the audience. Uh, there are some other connections to um, other kinds of high-dimensional statistics and neural networks as well. And um, the origin is really from, from physics uh, by Sherrington Kirkpatrick. They wanted to understand some uh, strange materials. And the interactions between the different atoms were very complicated, so they decided to model them as random. Um, the models I'm discussing are mean field because there's no three-dimensional structure. So if you start with a physical model, you think of the atoms as being arranged in a three-dimensional lattice. Um, but it's been fruitful to understand a totally mean field version of the problem as well. Um, our goal today will be efficient optimization. So we're going to want to understand when efficient algorithms can compute some uh, sigma, depending on this random function which the algorithm is given, uh, which come at least somewhere close to the maximum value of the function. Um, one motivation is that if this is impossible, if efficient algorithms cannot get anywhere close to the maximum value, uh, then this would allow us to reject the null hypothesis more aggressively in tensor PCA. So if I give you a, a tensor and I, I tell you that I think it's coming from just an IID Gaussian uh, model, and you try to find the MLE and you do better than you should be able to for any efficient algorithm, then you can reject uh, the null hypothesis. So this is some natural way to, to think about a possible hypothesis testing algorithm. Um, if you think about brute force search over an n-dimensional sphere, this is going to be very inefficient, um, of course. Um, and the landscape is very crazy. It's not convex at all. It, it kind of 
you should think of it as looking like this, but in n dimensions instead of two or three. Uh, so you can't just run gradient descent, and also, uh, like the problems I discussed at the start, it's, it's certainly NP-hard in the worst case. Um, any questions about the, the setup so far? Okay, great. So, so again, uh, our setup is we have this random um, objective function. It's kind of a very generic random objective function, and we'd like to understand how well we can optimize it in an efficient way. Um, let me say a little bit for people who have uh, seen uh, easing models in other contexts. So um, the original easing model was a ferromagnetic model. You have maybe a graph, you have some couplings on the edges which are all positive. So for example, the graph might be a lattice as you can see here. Uh, yeah. And uh, in the classical easing model when the, um, the couplings are positive, uh, there's basically a tension between energy and entropy. So if you think of this Gibbs measure where you weight the uniform distribution by, by your energy function, um, if you take beta large, let's say, uh, it's going to concentrate on kind of an ordered state, uh, all plus or all minus. These are the two ways to maximize your energy function. It's very easy to think of how to maximize this uh, ferromagnetic uh, Hamiltonian here. You just make all the sigmas uh, the same, let's say if you're on the cube. But uh, on a spin glass, the, the whole point is that you're, and you're dealing with a frustrated model. Um, you can't um, get every term to go the right direction. And, and this is why the problem is hard, even in the kind of uh, large beta limiting regime, which is very easy in the ferromagnetic case. Um, so, so there's a lot uh, that physicists will tell you about this model. Um, there's not just one fa phase transition, there's, there's quite a bunch. Um, here are some of them. Uh, so when beta is small, which means that we're close to a uniform distribution, this is high temperature, uh, then if I think of running dynamics, like Glaber dynamics, Langevin dynamics, um, I'm going to mix very fast, and so that's kind of telling me the distribution is not so different from being on a sphere. And then if I increase beta a little bit, so I get further from my uniform distribution, um, my mixing will uh, get a bit worse, there will be a few metastable states, but mostly the metastable states will be kind of isolated and rare. Uh, and then things will get kind of worse and worse, they'll get further and for further from a nice uniform distribution on a sphere, uh, and there will, be, there will be lots of clustering that happens. Uh, there are similar predictions for the random k-set model as well, so you have n variables, some alpha n constraints, and you think about uh, increasing alpha. Um, and there's this um, famous picture here that kind of illustrates what's going on. It's, it's the same phase transition. So, so early on, your, your, um, your satisfying solutions, let's say for KSAT, are all connected to each other. There's just one big blob. That's like uh, this uh, beta less than beta d plus uh, bullet point. Uh, and then eventually the, the solution space becomes disconnected, but there's still a giant component. And then it becomes more disconnected, and then it becomes even more disconnected, and then in case that there's finally a regime where you just don't have any solutions anymore. Um, and as you might imagine, there's been a tremendous amount of work on basically uh, every um, part of this picture, uh, showing various uh, parts of this are true. So coming back to optimization, uh, we have this model that is predicted by physicists to have all kinds of different phase transitions. Um, so which of these phase transitions should be relevant for efficient optimization? Like, is, is, is it true that when the, um, the Gibbs measure kind of becomes very disconnected, this means the optimization becomes hard? Uh, wh what should be responsible for, for you know, telling me how well I can optimize my function? Um, so, so again, our goal is just, I'm given this function, I'd like to optimize it. And, and the, the true optimal value is known. It's given by Parisi's formula. If you think about large p, it grows as something like square root log p. Um, but there, there's an exact constant for every p. Um, but again, it looks like this random landscape, so, so maybe we can't hope to find the true optimum. Um, to kind of uh, give away the game a little bit, um, the, the picture I'll try to uh, explain is that uh, there are algorithmic thresholds for optimization. Um, they're going to be characterized by a uh, phase transition but it'll be really of a geometric nature. It'll be in the level sets of my random function. And uh, what I mean by this, when I say the word geometric, 
is that you can't understand it by looking at the Gibbs measures, really. Uh, you have to kind of treat this as a different phase transition that's um, different from the pictures I showed you before. Okay, um, so I've, I've said a bunch of um, abstract things. I've taken you all over the place. Um, so if you're a little lost, this is a good place to come back because I'm now going to show you uh, a very uh, explicit, um, nice optimization algorithm to solve this problem. And it'll turn out to be a very good one. Um, so this is due to Subog from 2018. Um, and the idea is to be greedy, but not in a gradient way, but in a Hessian way instead, uh, which is a little counterintuitive. And uh, here on the upper right, you can see the picture for uh, how the algorithm works. So um, here's how we're going to optimize our function on the sphere. We're going to start from zero, which is not on the sphere, it's the center of the sphere. And we're going to explore outward in this, uh, in this way. Um, at each time, if I'm at a point xt, uh, I'm going to look at the orthogonal subspace to xt. That's this little uh, xt perp at the end of the line. And we're going to look at the Hessian of our objective function on this orthogonal subspace. And then we're going to take the top eigenvector of this uh, restricted Hessian. So this is kind of the best greedy direction to move in, which is orthogonal to our current position. And then we're just going to move in this direction, maybe with a random sign on it. Um, you can kind of either move in the, you know, I mean, there's a symmetry, so it doesn't matter. And uh, kind of at the end, we're going to eventually move outward to the sphere um, because we're exploring outward at kind of a deterministic rate. You can see from the Pythagorean theorem that your squared L2 norm grows by delta every step. So, so after one over delta steps, you get to the sphere of the correct radius and you stop and that's, that's the algorithm. Um, does this algorithm um, make sense to people? Awesome. So, so we're, just, we're just taking steps which are orthogonal to our current position. How do we analyze this? Um, well, it turns out it's uh, not, it's rather intuitive to analyze. Um, the reason is that if you think of this Hessian at any step, uh, it's just a GOE random matrix, which is just kind of the most generic um, symmetric Gaussian matrix you could de design. So the Hessian is always a symmetric matrix because we have a Gaussian process, it should be a Gaussian. Um, and so what, what it turns out is that the Hessian of our random function at any point at a given radius is just a Gaussian symmetric matrix times some scaling factor shown in red that depends on P and depends on the radius Q at which we've explored so far. And if I have a Gaussian symmetric matrix, uh, it's uh, very well known what the top eigenvalue is. Uh, it's basically two times whatever scaling factor. Uh, and so what that means is that uh, we can just integrate over, over time, we can, we can sum over the steps how much uh, objective value we're gaining at every step. And if you just take an integral because you're taking a small step size, uh, you get a number. And for a p spin model, it's two square root p minus one over p. So that's what this algorithm gets you to. Um, I'm cheating a little bit. So in doing this analysis, I'm pretending that let's say x1 and x2 are independent of the function I'm trying to optimize. And of course they're not, they came from the function. Um, but it turns out this is okay. So, so um, one of Subog's really nice insights is that um, for lower bounding the performance of the algorithm, uh, this is fine. Um, okay, um, good. Uh, so this is a nice algorithm. Uh, how well does it do? Well, at first glance, it doesn't do very well. So I told you that the true optimal value is about square root log p. Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, so, um, well, I, I guess it, you, you could look in all directions. I mean, it, it wouldn't hurt you um, to, Oh, sorry, you're saying moving radially, or? Well, I guess the, the point of this is that because you're moving um, orthogonally, you're, you're kind of um, growing your radius more slowly. So, so if you think of moving radially, like you're, 
your radius is increasing a lot faster than if you move orthogonally to your current point, right? So if you think of like your current radius is like how much you've explored so far, and one minus your radius is like how much more room you have to optimize in the future. If you're moving orthogonally, you're kind of using this exploration budget up less slowly. That's how I would think of it. So, so you could try to move radially, but you would like need a much stronger incentive to do so. Uh, yeah, that's true. You should you should think of this as like trying to explore a lot of this space. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's how you can think about it. Yeah. I mean, um, in in some sense, you know, uh, but because we're in high dimensions, you can you can write down any algorithm you want and analyze it kind of explicitly. Um, so you could also like. Like any any suggestion like this, you could write down it down and analyze it, and I, I think it would just not do as well. So that's that's something else you could say. But, uh, another thing I should say is that um, uh, th this will end up being a good algorithm. Uh, that means that eventually we should end up at a critical point on the sphere. Uh, it turns out that every point along this trajectory, the the gradient will be just radial. So so um, one justification for using the Hessian is that if you use the gradient, you're, you're moving radially anyway. So, so that's kind of one natural strategy and the kind of other natural strategy is to use the Hessian. But yeah, it's certainly a weird algorithm. Okay, um, any other questions about the algorithm? This is a good spot to ask questions. Okay. Um, so, so as I was saying, um, this, this algorithm gets you a value that's about two, uh, and the true optimal value is about square root log p. It grows with p, so it doesn't look like it's doing so well. Um, but it's, it's better than it looks based on this. Um, and uh, to justify that, uh, you can look at uh, slightly more general models, where instead of having a homogeneous polynomial, uh, you make your objective function a sum of terms of different degrees. So I'll have a random cubic term plus a random quartic term plus a random degree eight term, and there will be some coefficients that just govern how much of each degree there are. Uh, th these are still centered Gaussian processes. You can think of them uh, in a very similar way. And for some of these, uh, the algorithm I just showed you is uh, best possible in, in the sense that it actually reaches the true optimal value. Um, I, I won't explain so much where this comes from, uh, but there's an explicit condition um, on this uh, generating polynomial psi that uh, tells you how much of different degrees are contributing. Um, and, uh, okay, so it's psi double prime is to the minus a half is concave. Basically, it, it's, um, this condition holds when you're close to a quadratic. So if your objective function is mostly quadratic parts, then this uh, strange looking algorithm will actually get to the asymptotically um, correct value like the, the true optimal value up to an error that shrinks with them. So, so it's doing something right. Uh, to, to see um, another, a bit of a preview of uh, where we're about to go, um, you can take this algorithm I've just shown you and you can use it to, to get not just one solution but a lot of solutions. Um, so let me draw this. Uh, so we start here at the origin. Um, after our first step, we can, I said to take the top eigenvector, but you could take the top two or three eigenvectors, right? And if you do this every time, you'll construct a, a big tree of solutions, and every one of these solutions will be just as good, basically, as um, the analysis I just uh, outlined, because the top two or three eigenvectors of a typical um, Gaussian random matrix will be just as, as good as the top one. Um, and what, what will, it turns out what happens is that, well, um, when the true Gibbs measure has this kind of continuously branching structure, so, so more or less, um, when the true Gibbs measure, uh, you weight the sphere by e to the beta h, um, looks something like this for, in some sense, then opt will equal alg. Um, and otherwise it won't. 
So, so for a pure p-spin model, um, I, the structure does not look like this, but there are cases where, where this algorithmic tree is kind of really constructing the Gibbs measure. Okay, uh, but don't worry if you didn't uh, follow that. Um, now I want to change gears a little bit and um, argue that this algorithm is kind of really, really good. Uh, so I said something about why it's good. It's sometimes optimal, um, but maybe it's not always optimal. Uh, so what can we say about that? So, so we have this threshold that this algorithm of Subag gives us. Um, we'd like to, I'd like to tell you why it's, the threshold it gives is kind of fundamental for a rather general class of algorithms and um, explain a geometric characterization of this threshold. Um, so, so like in Anker's talk, I'm phrasing these as questions, but the answer is, is kind of uh, dictated by what I'm going to say. Um, so so uh, this goes via the overlap gap property. Um, and there was uh, first some progress on this problem by Gamarnik, Jagannath, and Alex Wein. And what they did was they considered a family of stable algorithms. Uh, I won't define it axiomatically, but um, it includes many of our favorite algorithms like gradient descent, Langevin dynamics, as long as you run them on kind of dimension-free time scales. And what they showed is that um, stable algorithms viewed as functions of the uh, Hamiltonian, HM, to the sphere, cannot reach um, the true optimal value unless Subog's algorithm already succeeded. So there's something fundamental about the case in which uh, this Hessian ascent algorithm succeeds. And uh, they gave a really interesting proof using the overlap gap property. It's kind of a topological argument, and I'll, I'll show you an outline of how it works. So what we're going to do is um, think of a, not just one instance of our problem, but a bunch of different instances. Um, more precisely, I'm going to generate uh, two independent copies of my random function, hn0 and hn1, and I'm going to draw a path between them parameterized by t, which goes from 0 to 1. And the nice thing about this path is that because I'm dealing with centered Gaussians, every function hn t along this path has the same marginal distribution. And so if I feed this whole path into an algorithm that solves the problem well, then this algorithm has to solve the problem well on every single function along this path. And um, I, I said something about stable algorithms. Uh, for the purposes of this slide, a stable algorithm is just one where you can um, think of this continuous path of objective functions to be optimized as giving you a continuous path of solutions when you feed it into the algorithm. So the picture you can have is like this. Uh, I have this path of energy functions HNT. I plug it into my algorithm and I get some solution path uh, sigma t. And an overlap gap property uh, which they established for this problem is going to tell you the following. Uh, it's going to say that there's some medium distance QOGP uh, which serves as kind of a moat. Uh, it's kind of a geometric barrier to optimization. What it means is that um, if I consider any t along this path and any sigma zero, sigma t on my sphere, if the distance between sigma zero and sigma t is more or less equal to QOGP, so if these two points, sigma zero and sigma t, are at medium distance, then at least one of them is suboptimal. So there's no pair of optimal solutions at medium distance. Um, even though I'm going to plug in eight, uh, sigma zero into my hn zero function, and I'm going to plug in sigma t into my hn t function. So, so even for kind of this ensemble of different objective functions, there's no pair of optima at medium distance. If this is so, and this is something that they proved, uh, then you conclude that any algorithm does worse than the true optimal value uh, basically by a continuity because a stable algorithm, it should cross this medium distance uh, mode at some point. That's, that's when this, um, this red circle in the picture gets crossed. And at that point, you're not uh, at an optimal solution. Okay, uh, so this overlap gap property uh, has been used in uh, quite a few works. Uh, it started uh, almost 10 years ago with Gamarnik and Sudan looking at um, large independent sets on random regular graphs. Uh, what they wanted to show was that local algorithms, algorithms which only do computation in a bounded radius neighborhood, uh, are kind of inherently suboptimal 
uh, for finding large independent sets. Um, and they showed they're suboptimal by some constant factor. And um, there were subsequent improvements. Um, uh, notably, uh, Rockman and Virag uh, looked at a more complicated multi-OGP. They said, all right, let's, let's say that not only are there no pairs of solutions at medium distance, but um, we're going to run the algorithm a bunch more times in a more complicated way. And we're gonna show that there's no four tuple or, or 10 tuple of solutions which are all at medium distance from each other. Whereas an algorithm would be able to construct such a, a structure. So if you can show that these more complicated configurations don't exist in the landscape at good objective values, then you can still show hardness. And um, they did this and they, they showed kind of an optimal approximation factor for this problem. Uh, there's a similar story in random KSAT using a slightly different type of um, forbidden structure. Uh, the story here is that the satisfiability threshold is about two to the K log two. And optimal algorithms uh, can uh, solve random KSAT until uh, clause density two to the K log K over K. So there's a, there's a gap here uh, which is provable using another version of the overlap gap property. Um, I should say that uh, I mentioned a few different uh, exotic features of these uh, Gibbs measures um, earlier on in the talk, that they, they can kind of lead to probability distributions very different from uniform on the sphere where there's all sorts of clustering behavior, um, bottlenecks, and so on. Uh, the overlap gap property was really inspired by these, um, but, but the key feature that lets it give you kind of rigorous guarantees is that it requires there to be no medium distance pairs at all, rather than just kind of maybe medium distance pairs are very rare. Uh, and this will be kind of the key to what I um, said at the start about how the algorithmic thresholds are really not um, corresponding to a property of Gibbs measures. Um, okay, so uh, on this slide, I'm going to state the first uh, result that's uh, due to me. Um, so this is uh, with Bryce. Uh, it's two papers, but um, I'll just uh, state it all at once. Uh, the result is basically that this algorithm of Subog is getting exactly the optimal um, approximation factor, so it's getting exactly the correct objective value um, within some class of algorithms. And I'll state precisely more or less what this class of algorithms is. Uh, so again, I'm thinking of an algorithm as a function of this random objective. In particular, my random objective has a bunch of Gaussian coefficients, so my algorithm is a function of these Gaussians. And um, I'm going to consider algorithms which have a Lipschitz constant which is independent of the system size. Uh, so this is a notion of stability. It's a precise way to say that my algorithm is stable. And our result says that no algorithm with this property can achieve any energy better than the algorithmic threshold of Subog's algorithm. Uh, what do Lipschitz algorithms include? Um, it's very similar to um, what I said before, gradient descent, lens of dynamics. Um, the jury is still a little bit out on low degree polynomials. Uh, moreover, the result holds in a very strong sense, um, which was not true for the results um, before. Uh, namely, the chance to get better than alg plus epsilon is always exponentially small in alg. So this is of the same order as if you just guess blindly. Um, and we did this using a new branching version of the overlap gap property. And um, in fact, we, we showed that within the framework of overlap gap properties, you needed to use our more complicated method or you would not be able to get down to this um, optimal threshold. Um, here's a little picture of what's going on. So as I showed here and I drew on the blackboard, uh, algorith Subog's algorithm constructs trees of solutions. Uh, so what we did was we used a version of the overlap gap property that kind of matches this fact. Um, so, so the first overlap gap property I, I showed you rules out pairs of solutions at medium distance. Then you can think about tuples of more solutions at medium distance, or you can think about kind of ladder structures where there's a distance from you know, uh, one solution to the previous ones in some sense. Uh, to get the sharp threshold for uh, this problem, uh, we needed to use a branching overlap gap property uh, where what you do is you rule out uh, configurations of points at energy above alg uh, whose geometric structure is kind of given by an arb arbitrarily complicated tree. Uh, so if you know what the word means, um, what I'm thinking of is a general ultrametric space. Um, so what's going on here? Well, 
if I had an algorithm that could take in a bunch of different objective functions and build a tree structure of outputs like this, then um, similarly to what I said before, uh, you would kind of say that you know, the algorithm constructs this, this set configuration. This configuration, uh, I can't find any configuration like this where the, uh, the different points in the configuration have a large objective value, therefore there's some contradiction. Uh, I showed you that Subog's algorithm can build trees, um, but it's not clear at all why kind of a generic stable algorithm like gradient descent should be able to build trees. Uh, so that's what, what I'll um, explain in the next couple of slides. Uh, and I, I won't really explain how this uh, lets you identify the energy algorithm. I'll, I'll just explain kind of the, the geometric uh, connection. Um, what's going on? Uh, well, actually what we need instead of Lipschitz is really this property called overlap concentration. So it's a bit more specific than stability. Um, but it's kind of something that uh, you should think of as being generic in high dimensions. It says that if I take two objective functions, hn0 and hnt, so they're kind of t correlated, um, so, so, so uh, every pair of corresponding Gaussians in my, my random tensors is correlated by some amount t. Um, then if I plug these both into the same algorithm, the normalized inner product between the two outputs is going to concentrate tightly uniformly in t. It'll concentrate tightly around some value I'll call chi of t. Um, in the, the picture of um, crossing the, the moat at a medium distance, basically this is saying that uh, different paths will cross the same moat at about the same time. Uh, if I have a Lipschitz algorithm, that this follows immediately from concentration of measure. So this is the only place that Lipschitz is ever actually used. Um, and the geometric connection works like this. Uh, if I have an overlap concentrated algorithm in the sense, then I can build a tree of solutions um, just by running it on the correct family of Hamiltonians. Uh, namely, I'm going to build a, I'm going to start with a tree of Hamiltonians uh, as shown here on the left, um, where what's going on is that um, the correlations between different pairs here uh, depends on their distance in this uh, tree structure I've drawn. So uh, if, if I have a pair of these Hamiltonians whose uh, common ancestor is the root of the tree, then their correlation level is going to be some value p0. And if I just use this definition of overlap concentration, what that tells me is that the uh, normalized inner product of the algorithmic outputs on the right-hand side uh, is going to be essentially equal to some value q0, which is just this deterministic function chi applied to p0. And if I have neighbors in this uh, tree on the left, then the, um, the inner product between their outputs will concentrate around some different value q1, which is a function of the correlation p1 of the Gaussians on the left-hand side. And if you have this for all pairs, then this basically tells you that you get a tree structure um, on the right-hand side. Okay? Um, moreover, um, this function chi that transforms correlations is continuous. So you can always just take the values of q on the right-hand side to be 1 over d, 2 over d, 3 over d, and so on for some large constant d, and then just back solve for the values of p uh, that determine the correlations between the Gaussians at the start. If you do this, then what you've constructed more or less is a continuously branching tree of solutions. And so the branching overlap gap property that we had to show in, which is kind of the, the technically um, difficult part of this whole story, uh, is to show that any um, configuration as on the right-hand side that's kind of branching kind of really in every single step, like this um, picture on the board, uh, has average energy uh, at most alg plus epsilon. So in particular, um, there's some point that has energy worse than alg plus epsilon. Okay. Um, any like high level questions about uh, what I've said so far here? Okay, great. Um, so that, that was kind of um, the, the main uh, story that I wanted to um, explain. Um, but there are some uh, further results that I'd also like to say that kind of show that this picture is uh, not so restricted to this uh, individual model. Uh, so, so first I wanted to say that the, essentially the same picture uh, holds up in some other settings too. Uh, so the, the first one is just if you change the state space to the cube instead of the sphere, 
everything is more or less the same except the formulas are quite a bit more complicated. Uh, there's some stochastic optimal control. If you know the Prezi formula, it becomes much more complicated. Um, but you have the same kind of picture of an orthogonally branching uh, tree of solutions and, um, and a, the same kind of matching threshold. Uh, I mentioned that there are some connections to um, combinatorial optimization problems. Uh, these connections also hold on the level of these algorithms, both, both for algorithms and for, for hardness. So if you're thinking of max cut on a random graph or a random KSAT, as long as the clause density is large, uh, then, then the same picture will hold. So this is like random KSAT with a clause density alpha that's large enough depending on K. Um, random KSAT where the clause density is really a constant is kind of a more difficult problem. Um, another uh, story where uh, this um, framework gave a sharp answer was for matching random graphs. So there's a problem of uh, matching correlated graphs. Uh, and there's kind of a null model version of this problem where I give you two independent erdos rini random graphs. And you, um, you try to match them, meaning you give a bijection of the vertex set from one graph to the, to the vertex set of the other graph. Uh, you'd like to match them so that you have as many kind of overlapping edges as possible. And um, these uh, three uh, authors showed that uh, our, the branching overlap gap property gave you a sharp approximation ratio for a certain class of algorithms to do this. Uh, I should say that this is a different Huang. So uh, these three authors really like had, you know, they, they read through what we did and they, they figured it out and they, they applied it. So it was very impressive. Um, Okay, another uh, type of model you can look at um, is called a multi-species spin loss, which is a less symmetric situation. Uh, so what you can think here is um, maybe you have two sets of variables, sigmas and, and rows, and uh, your objective function is a polynomial that's symmetric among the sigmas and kind of symmetric among the row, among the row coordinates, um, but, but kind of not all the coordinates are symmetric. It's just the first half of the coordinates all look the same, the second half all look the same. Um, for this model, um, there's kind of a version of Suvog's algorithm that uh, still works. Uh, so you're trying to find a solution where each set of coordinates lives on a sphere. And so you kind of now have two spheres to explore outward on. And um, the one degree of freedom you have is deciding which sphere you want to grow on more. So you could imagine like, exploring faster in your first set of variables for a while and then doing the exploration in your second set of variables or vice versa. Um, so, so in the case of two species, you, you get um, upright curves in the plane and uh, you can have all sorts of interesting uh, phenomena. So the, the situation on the right is something surprising where um, you have two sets of variables. Uh, they're playing symmetric roles. Uh, so you would kind of expect an algorithm to just explore the two spheres at the same rate but actually the optimal algorithms don't. The optimal algorithms have to make some symmetry break in and explore one side first. Um, we were really excited about this because um, the true optimal value is not actually known in these models, um, but uh, we were able to find the sharp algorithmic threshold even though this isn't true. So we know the best algorithm, but we don't know the right approximation ratio because we don't know what the denominator is. Um, another interesting, um, situation you can look at is when your Hamiltonian is biased. So everything I said, it's kind of based on these Hessian ascent algorithms. And this isn't totally insane because uh, you start at maybe the origin, that's kind of where you would start out, and the gradient of your objective function is zero. So why not use the Hessian, at least to start? Um, but you could imagine adding a linear term to your Hamiltonian and this would bias things. So if I add a linear term to my objective function, then certainly I should be somehow correlated with that direction. What happens is the same kind of picture. You have a branching uh, tree of solutions, um, but this tree has a non-trivial root which is correlated with your linear term, and you have to do a first step where you find it. Interestingly, if you make your linear term too strong, then the tree degenerates entirely, and uh, you'll just, get to some point on the, on the boundary of the sphere. There's no, there's no uh, Hessian at all, um, and, and things become very simple. Um, what, what we showed uh, just this month is that uh, this kind of algorithmic degeneration actually really corresponds to the, the model not behaving in a glassy way at all. So the, the point of these spin glass models in some sense is to consider very disordered, complicated energy functions where 
you'll have all sorts of complicated behavior in various senses. Um, if your external field is really strong, if, you're, if your linear term is too strong, um, then uh, you'll actually have a unique local optimum. So you're not convex, but it's almost like you're convex. Um, you have a nice spectral gap. You have all sorts of nice things. So, um, so this algorithmic transition um, kind of coincides with a real uh, phase transition in whether or not the, the model behaves in a truly complex way or not. Um, I still haven't really justified my claim that um, the Gibbs measures aren't enough to recover what I've said. Uh, so I'll do that now for the binary perceptron model. Uh, this is yet another kind of type of uh, disordered random optimization problem. Uh, what's happening here is that we'd like to find a Boolean solution to a bunch of symmetric slab constraints. Um, the picture is maybe like this. I have my, um, my cube. Uh, I have a bunch of constraints which are symmetric slabs, so maybe like this, um, maybe another one like this. And I'm intersecting these slabs and I'm, like, I'm trying to find a point in their intersection. Uh, so kappa is just some parameter here that determines the width of my slabs. Um, without the symmetric constraint, without the absolute value, um, this corresponds to a neural network memorization problem, which is why it was studied in the 80s in um, physics. Um, an interesting feature is that, um, well, okay, there's, there's been quite a bit of work on this problem. Uh, but a really striking feature is that uh, if you look at a typical solution, it's completely isolated from any other solution. Uh, for, any for any constraint density alpha, this is going to be true. So, so if for any constraint density, I look at this intersection of a bunch of slabs with the Boolean cube. I look at a uniformly random point in this intersection. With exponentially high probability, it's going to be at a linear Hamming distance from any other solution. Uh, this is called frozen 1RSB. Um, this, uh, and this is kind of a crazy property because um, Kim and Roche in 98 showed that there are algorithms that can find solutions, at least for rather small alpha. But if, if all the solutions are isolated, it doesn't seem like you should be able to find one. Um, the, resol the resolution um, to this uh, seems to be that algorithms can find rare dense clusters of solutions. Um, this uh, was kicked off in a physical review letters paper that uh, found this behavior empirically, that when they just used uh, reasonable algorithms to try to find solutions, they weren't finding uniformly random solutions, they were finding kind of rare dense clusters of solutions. Um, and what the, what, um, the branching overlap gap property I, I've uh, presented kind of suggests is that a good definition for a dense cluster is one of these um, continuously branching tree structures. Uh, in some work that's uh, still ongoing with Bryce and Nike, uh, we, we use this to kind of uh, compute the algorithmic threshold for a wide class of perceptron problems. This is again a model where the, uh, the true optimal threshold in this case, the satisfiability threshold is not generally known. Um, here's a final curiosity which I'll uh, end with before my concluding slide. Um, so uh, I've, I've shown you a kind of unusual algorithm, Hessian ascent. Um, you could ask about what about the usual algorithms you would try. So what about gradient descent or Langevin dynamics? So they probably won't get to the true optimum, but how well do they do? Uh, so in particular, um, uh, what, what you can think about is Langevin dynamics with, um, with a small amount of noise. So this corresponds to large beta. Uh, this is the uh, equation for it. Um, it turns out that in the special case of pure models on the sphere, so a homogeneous random polynomial on the sphere, uh, you don't need to use Subog's algorithm. Uh, all you have to do is run Langevin dynamics at low temperature for a large amount of time, both of which are kind of dimension free, and you'll reach the algorithmic threshold value. So one side of this bound comes from what I said more or less, uh, and the other side requires a separate argument to show that you actually climb uh, far enough. Um, but this is really only true for mixed models, or for pure models. If you have a mixed model where in terms of uh, different degrees, uh, it's uh, understood by simulations to be much more complicated. For example, um, you, can, you can kind of uh, decrease uh, the temperature gradually and depending on how you do that, the long time energy you settle at can, can be different. So there are a lot of uh, very difficult open problems on just analyzing Langevin dynamics for these models. Um, here's a conclusion for what I've said. Uh, so we looked at mean field spin glasses, so 
constant degree polynomials with IID Gaussian coefficients. And um, what we found was that there's a sharp algorithmic threshold for energy achievable by uh, stable algorithms. Um, for spherical P-spin glasses, the, um, the threshold takes a nice form. And it has a nice geometric characterization, uh, which is the largest energy value, so the super level sets of your objective function contain certain uh, dense clusters, uh, namely these uh, certain uh, branching trees. Uh, I'll end with a, a question that I'm very uh, interested in. Um, it would be wonderful to understand if there is any kind of geometric or otherwise um, characterization for efficient sampling instead of optimization. Um, thanks very much, and let me know if there are further questions.